Now, we've been talking about David all summer. David is, um, he started out as the shepherd boy who fights a giant named Goliath, leads the nation of Israel to victory. He becomes a military general and a serious lover of God, worshiper. Um, he's, a, he's a musician. He's writing songs and poetry. And everybody loves him except the king. King Saul tries to kill him over and over and over and over again. And David is innocent almost every single time he is being chased. He's the hero. He's the guy that we look up to. There's a million reasons for you and I to look at David and be like, David, man, he's a great hero, and he's a man after God, and he's just a really, really awesome guy. But there's one day that David, when he is king, does something incredibly evil. One day, one day David has, um, isn't doing what he's supposed to be doing. Instead of leading uh, his people, he, he, he's lazy, and uh, he goes outside, and he sees a very beautiful woman, and he says, I want her. Bring her to me. And what ends up happening is he finds out that this woman is married to his friend named Uriah. And this woman's name is Bathsheba. And, and David finds out she's married. She's married to his friend. In fact, Uriah serves David. Uriah is one of David's closest military guys. And David says... Nope, I've got to have her. So he tells one of his generals, he says, hey, here's what I want you to do. When it's time for battle, I want you, I want you to take Uriah, and I want you to send him into the heaviest fighting. And then I want you to make everyone retreat except for him. So he dies. And this is what happens. Joab, his general, they go out to battle. And Joab tells, tells some of his men, hey, I want you to go right up to the wall, which is the most dangerous part. If you're in medieval, like if you're in ancient battle times, you don't run up to the wall. Because at the wall, do you know what can happen? People can throw rocks at you and kill you, right? Like that's a stupid place to try to fight. Ah, that's a terrible place to be in a battle. And he sends Uriah and some of these guys to the wall, and they get to the wall, and Joab says, everybody back, and Uriah dies, fighting at the wall. And David hears word, David hears word that Uriah is dead, and he takes Bathsheba, and he marries her. And he thinks, David thinks that nobody knows about this. You know, there's only a couple people that, that knew what he had done. And so David thinks he's gotten away with it. But do you know who sees every single thing that we do? No, not Santa Claus. God, yes. God sees every single thing that we do. And so God, God speaks to, he speaks to somebody. There's a guy, a prophet named Nathan, one of, one of, um, one of the prophets trained by Samuel named Nathan. And one day while Nathan is praying, he hears God speak to him, and, 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 um, and God tells Nathan, David has committed a sin, and he's stolen. And he thinks that nobody knows about this, but I need you to go and confront David. And Nathan normally had conversations with David. It's actually a normal thing that the prophets would come in and they would say, hey, um, king, there's this situation. Um, there's a situation we're dealing with. We need some help. And so Nathan comes into David, and David has no idea that Nathan knows. He has no idea. But Nathan comes in, and he says, hey, David, um, there's a situation I'm dealing with, and I need your advice. There's a, there's a, really, there's a really rich man who has everything he could ever want. And then there's a poor man who all he has is one sheep. And 
And every single day, this poor man takes care of the sheep. I mean, he treats it like a kid. He brings his sheep inside. It sits, it sits by his dinner table. He washes it every night. He brushes it every night. It's his one sheep. He loves his sheep. He cares for his sheep. This other guy has flocks of sheep. But one day, a traveler came into town, and the rich man wanted to impress him, and he didn't want to use one of his own sheep. So he stole the poor man's sheep, and he had it killed for dinner. And, and Nathan tells David this story. He says, hey, what do you think we should do? What do you think we should do when this happened? Sa- 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 5, it says this. David was furious in the same way that you and I were probably really mad at Remy, at the same way that you're really mad at this rich guy who stole the poor man's sheep. David was furious. As surely as the Lord lives, he vowed, any man who would do such a thing deserves to die. He must repay four lambs to the poor man for the one he stole and for having no pity. Verse 7, Nathan said, you are that man. Now, now here's this moment. David knew better, and he thought he got away with it. And in this moment, he's caught. At this moment, he realizes, have you ever noticed before that it's usually easier to judge somebody else for being bad, but when you do something bad, you're really easy on yourself? Like when somebody else, when somebody hits you, you're like, ow, that hurt, mom, they hit me. But when you punch somebody, you were like, hey, it was a joke. It was light. We were playing around. I thought it was mutual. Everybody was, right? It's really easy to go easy on yourself and hard on other people. And David begins to go hard on this imaginary man. And Nathan goes, no, 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 David. God has seen your sin. Before we go any further into today's psalm, I just wanted to share That God has seen our sin, and he knows us. So before we go any further in this message, we're going to take a few minutes in our small groups, and we're going to talk about this. What's the most important thing that you own? What would you do if someone took it from you and you couldn't get it back? What if you took something that special from someone else? How would you feel if you got caught? What would you do? And without reading the psalm, we're going to look at Psalms 51 today. What do you think that David would have prayed? All right, so turn in your tag groups. We're going to talk about this for a few minutes. We'll be back. All right, all right. Hey, J-Box, let me get you back. Let me get you back. Uh, so I can remember we used to, when I was in, when I was in JVox, after JVox on Sundays, um, we would go outside and we would, play, we would play football. It was just like a thing. Yeah, yeah, it was a lot of fun. But, so when I was in JVox, um, we would we'd finish, we'd finish service and then our parents would let us Um, go and play football in the gravel. And so uh, it was a lot of fun. Somebody was bleeding every single week. And then one week we decided, all right, you know what, let's get a little smarter. Let's play in the grass. That'll be be a little better. Um, But I remember one week my mom warned me we had, she had just got me like new pants, right? And so, um, so here's the deal, here's the deal. She was like, do not fall in the grass and get stains on these, right? Have you ever had that conversation, right? Don't get, okay, yeah. All right, so here's the deal. So here's the deal. Sure enough, do you know what happened? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I fully committed. Um, I fully committed. Somebody threw the ball. I, like, jumped to, to get it, um, slid on the grass, probably did not catch the ball, um, but I definitely had the stains. So here's the deal. I have a choice in that moment. I can pretend like it didn't happen, but the stain will stay. Like, if we don't take care of this right now, if we don't take care of this grass stain right now, that's going to be a permanent part of those pants forever. 
So either I can admit that I'm wrong now, and it can be dealt with and washed away and forgiven, or I can try to pretend like it's not there, but it's going to stick with me forever. Psalm 51, David says this, verse 1, have mercy on me, O God, because of your unfailing love, because of your great compassion, blot out the stain of my sins. Wash me clean from my guilt. Purify me from my sin. You know what David does? He admits, God, I was wrong. I want to talk to you this, this morning about in moments when we find out that we have done something wrong, I think there are, there are three things that we can do. So I want to say it like this. When I feel guilty, and there will be times that you and I will have done something wrong, we'll feel guilty, but it's like this. When I feel guilty, I can psalm or sing or pray or write or worship by admitting my wrong, asking God for help, and drawing closer to God. Admitting my wrong, asking God for help, and drawing closer to God. So when I feel guilty, this is our response. And this is what David does. The very first thing he begins to sing and cry out to God, he says, God, God, I've messed up. And I need your forgiveness. He says, I need you to wash me. I need you to get rid of this. Because otherwise, this is going to be a stain on me. If I don't ask you, if I don't ask you to forgive me, this is going to live with me. Can I tell you something? That when we do things that are wrong, Without God's forgiveness, they stay with us. Without God's forgiveness, it's, it's not a sticker, it's a freckle. Without God's forgiveness, it becomes a permanent part of who you are. But God's forgiveness is the only one that can wash it away. And David knows this. And so the first thing he does is he says, God, I know I'm wrong. I need your mercy and I need your love and I need your compassion. God, would you forgive me? Purify me from my sin. He knows that he needs God's forgiveness. Psalms 51 verse 16, he says this, You do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. You know what? David realizes that um, that the thing that matters the most to God is his heart. And I want to say that to you, that what matters the most in this, in moments like this, is your heart. See, God's not looking for a dollar amount or a payoff or anything like that. He, he's looking for your heart. You know, there was, um, there, there was a couple, uh, well, not a couple, it was, a, it was years ago, years ago now, um, Rihanna, my wife, was, uh, she was taking our kids to like a birthday party or something, and she drove by this house that had these chairs outside, like, like, like um, you know, like large leather chairs, big chairs, and so, um, and so she saw them, and she was like, gosh, those are really nice, they're just by the curb, somebody's throwing them away, maybe there's something wrong with them, um, but, but, you know, the, the more you look at them, you're like, ah, those are really, really, really nice chairs. And so she came home later that day and was like, Josh, I saw these really, really nice chairs. Um, I think we should go go see if they're th throwing them away or giving them away. And I was like, okay, let's go. How nice can they be? And I show up and there's still these two giant, beautiful leather chairs, like pristine looking. I, and we, we go out and we're looking at them. We're like, gosh, these are really, really nice looking chairs. Let's Let's go see if they're getting rid of them. So we go to the door, and we knock. And we're like, hey, are you just throwing those away? And to, to the people there, they were like, oh, yeah, just take them. We don't even need them. We don't want them. They're just they're trash. To them, this was nothing. This was trash, right? And so picked up these, picked up these chairs, put them in, put them in our, our, our trunk. And, and do you know what's crazy, though? They left, they left the price tag on it. They left the price tag on the on the on the stickers or on the on the chairs, 
And um, we didn't know this when we picked it up. We just picked them up and we moved them. We got them home and we were setting them up. And we saw the price tag fall out. And I think originally, originally they were like five grand each. Now, now here's the deal. When we got home, we saw that. We were like, we're rich. You know, like we, we were like, this is incredible. This is amazing. Okay, all right. So, but that's kind of the point. That's actually kind of the point. I mean, we freaked out. That was like crazy. We were like, oh, my goodness, right? This is amazing. But to some people, five grand for a chair was nothing. You know, to some people, five grand, they were like, ah, it doesn't matter. We could spend that. We could throw it away in the trash. We don't even need to try to sell it. I mean, I'm like, like when I throw a sheet of paper away, I'm like, man, maybe we could put this on Facebook Marketplace, get some cash back. We think three cents, three cents, we could try. Now, here's the deal. You know what David realizes? That, that God's not interested in his money or his sacrifice because David could make a big sacrifice. He's probably the richest man in Israel. And so if God was like, hey, I want you to make a big sacrifice, David could make a big sacrifice. You know, he could do a big sacrifice to God. That's not what God cares about. God says, no, 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 no. I'm looking for something that is actually valuable, and that's your heart. I'm looking for something that really matters. That's your heart. That's the most important thing that we have to offer in this moment. When we've done something wrong, David recognizes you will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. So admit that we're wrong and ask God for help. Psalm 51, verse 10, David says, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a loyal spirit within me. Verse 12, Restore to me the joy of your salvation and make me willing to obey you. How many of you have an alarm that you set during the school year? Anybody have an alarm? Okay, how many of you, how many of you depend on a parent to wake you up during the school year, okay. Um, how many of you? How many of you have one of those like, uh, like large scale mechanical beds that like picks you up and shakes you out? And no, nobody. All right, so good. Uh, so here's the deal. Here's the deal. Do you know why we set alarms? Because your body by itself is naturally disobedient to the rules of your life. That's why you set alarms. The reason you set an alarm. Is because you can't go to bed at night and be like, hey, body, would you wake up at 6 a.m. for me? Your body's going to be like, yeah, right, sucker. We're going to sleep till 930. <laughs> right? If it were up to your body, you would probably miss your bus every day. If it were up to your body, you would never, ever. You would, here's what you would do. If it were up to you, I imagine most of you, most of you would stay up past midnight every single night. Uh, and then you wouldn't wake up until it was lunchtime. That's how you would live. That's how you would live life. Now, here's the deal. Now, here's the deal. What do we need? What do we need alarm clocks for? I need an alarm clock to keep me, to help me obey the rule that I have to get up at a certain time. Like, I know if I don't get up at a certain time, my house is going to be in chaos and disorder. I need an alarm to help me to obey. With the alarm at 6.20 in the morning, he goes, hey, Josh, wake up. And I'm like, no, not today, not today. But see, without the alarm, I'm not going to obey. When the alarm goes off, I'm like, okay, fine. Thank you for your help, stupid alarm. But you know what? You and I, by ourselves, are not great at obeying. There are times that you and I need outside help to obey. There are times that you and I need outside help to do what's right. Do you know what David does? He doesn't say, hey, God, I'm sorry. I got it from here. I'll be fine forever. I've got it. I'll always do the right thing from now on forever. He says, hey, God, I need your help. I need, I need you to give me a better mind. I need you to give me a better heart. 
I need you to help me obey. I need you to help me have joy. I need you to help change my thinking. I need your help, God. And can I tell you something? If you've done something wrong, admit that what you've done is wrong, and then ask God for help. Do you know who's really good at helping? God is. You and I, we need God's help. So David does this. Then the last thing that David does, so the first thing he does is he admits he's wrong. He asks God for help. And the last thing he does is he draws close or gets closer to God. When you've done something wrong, have you ever been uh, like, like nervous being around somebody that you've hurt or, uh, or nervous being around somebody that you've, like, like if you got in trouble with a teacher, isn't it true that like around that teacher for a little while, you're like really nervous around them? You're like a little extra quiet. You're a little extra attentive. Like when you get in trouble with your parents, you like walk a little differently around them. You're like trying to be, like it changes. Sometimes we can feel shame. And we don't want to be around the people that we've wronged. David does the exact opposite with God. Instead of, instead, of, instead of doing something wrong with God and being like, okay, gosh, oh my, I'm so embarrassed. I don't even want you to see me. I don't want you to know me. Don't talk to me. Um, I'm just going to be over here in a corner. No, no, no. Here's what David does. Verse 11. He says, do not banish me from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Do you know what David is asking God? He's saying, God, listen, I know, I know what I've done is wrong, but I don't want less of you. I want more of you. God, I, I know what I've done is wrong, but I, I need to have you around me. Would you come and surround me? Would you be with me? Would you be close to me? And so I want to encourage you guys today, JVox, because there's going to be moments when we've done something wrong and you feel guilty. And you might not know what you're supposed to do with that. But I'm really grateful that we have a guy like David who, who embarrassed himself way more, way more publicly. And his life is on is on display for us to learn from and his prayer and his worship is there for us to look at and if you ever find in your find yourself in a place where you feel guilty for something that you've done remember psalms 51 when i feel guilty i can sing i can psalm i can pray i can write i can worship by admitting my wrong asking god for help and drawing closer to him. And if you ever find yourself in a place like that, I want to encourage you, Javox. Would you do these things? Let me pray for us. Father God, we know that you love us so much that even when we've done what's wrong, you, you will forgive us. And so God, I, I pray that instead of running away and pretending like we don't need your help, and not admitting what we've done is wrong. God, I pray instead that we'd come to you. We find forgiveness by admitting that we were wrong. God, that we would uh, ask for help and that you would, you would really help us. God, and that, um, that we would draw near to you. And you'd actually pull us closer in this, this kind of like big spiritual hug. But, but God, that we'd actually have a closer relationship with you, not far from you. In Jesus' name, amen.